This is part two of our series titled Seven. Uh, I'm going to share this message with you today. We're going on a seven part series. And what we're looking at, we're looking at the seven churches in Revelation. Right at the beginning of the book of Revelation, the Apostle John writes to seven churches who are in seven cities in Asia. Now, I've shared with you last week that Asia in the New Testament is not today's Asia. Asia kind of grew east. Uh, in, during the Roman Empire, Asia was what we now call Me Middle East. Uh, there's the east and there's the Middle East. And, and it's particularly in Turkey is where this, this group of churches were. And they were, they were on a route, on a, on a route in, in, in Asia. And they started according to Re Revelation chapter 1, 11. The letters started from Ephesus. And if you look at the map, it goes in order. So the churches are Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, and Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea according to Revelation 1.11. So today, we're going to talk about the letter to the church in Smyrna. Um, last week, we started with Ephesus, and this week, we're going to talk about Smyrna. Now, I think the, 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 the world was so tough in the past. The generations that preceded us had so much suffering that the vision of living in a world as good as ours was so distant, was so far. I don't know if you understand this, but we live in the most comfortable, most advanced society that has ever existed. We are doing really good in terms of comfort, in terms of wealth, in terms of, look at us, we're here in premium seats, in an air-conditioned room, and you know, while it's 90 degrees out there, we're here just enjoying a cool, uh, climatized room this has never existed but even though they could see it far 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 away and they were striving for it I believe that the drive toward comfort has been so powerful that now that we have arrived at the most comfortable and most sophisticated generation to ever exist in the world the forward motion toward comfort the forward mo motion toward soothing our desires has gotten us confused and unprepared to fight real battles in life because our value system has been changed has been altered I think that in many ways because generations past were trying to flee poverty, trying to flee suffering, our progress and success and our systems have been hardwired to constantly drive us toward a life of comfort and less challenge. That's what our systems are designed to do. But there's a negative side to that. You may listen to this and think, oh, that's great. Less challenge, less less problems great well there's a negative side to that because the only way for you to grow is to challenge the status quo the only way for you to get stronger is to sustain a heavy load the only way for you to get faster is to run past your limit you have to press against your limits in order for you to get better and there's a kind of suffering that, yes, we should not desire. There's a kind of suffering we should not want. We should not want violence. We don't want abuse. We don't want destruction. We don't want murder. We don't want theft. We don't want these things that are aggressive and against the good of mankind. But comfort doesn't discriminate against good and bad suffering. Comfort doesn't know the difference between good suffering and bad suffering. And if we have been programmed by our systems and by our ways to always believe that better means more comfortable, we're going to misread seasons of growth as seasons of loss because there's discomfort and suffering in it. And I think too many people have baby-proofed their faith and are frustrated with where they are because they cannot progress in their relationship with God. 
They can't find a way to mature and grow in their relationship with God. Now, we have four kids. As many of you know that. And I've always been a proponent of only baby-proofing what's absolutely necessary around the house. If it's going to cause permanent damage, if it's going to threat their life, yes, we're going to baby-proof. But I'm not going to baby-proof every single aspect of the house to coddle their comfort or to coddle my own comfort, for that matter. We're not going to do it. And our son is about to turn two this month. He's a tall one. He's not even two years old yet. You look at him, you think he's might be four. But you know, he, he's not allowed to touch the stove. That would be irresponsible. Six months ago, he would love the sound of the igniter. Each morning, we would turn it. He would run to the kitchen to turn the knobs and touch the buttons. He's learned now. He doesn't get close to it anymore. So he's not allowed to touch the stove. But my eldest, she's 13. She's not only allowed, she's encouraged to touch the stove. You know, she can bake cupcakes and all the bad stuff that we're not supposed to have. She does it really well. She can cook rice and cook pasta. Yes, you can touch the stove. You can go ahead and make some meals and make a little extra for us too, okay? Our nine-year-olds, we have two of them, they are now at the point where they can fry their eggs in the morning. And they can do it without supervision. We're teaching them to handle different, uh, dangerous things according to their capacity. Why? Because we're raising kids toward maturity. We're raising kids toward a life where they can, they can take care of themselves and they can make sound judgment while handling dangerous things. This is important. The only time we want them to be fully dependent on us is on April 15th, y'all. That's tax day. We want them to be fully dependent on that day. See, our son cannot hold knives. That would be terribly irresponsible for us to allow him to hold knives. But my, my 13-year-old, she can handle a steak knife. She can handle a bread knife. And, and she, can, she can handle that. I might even let her carve the turkey for Thanksgiving this year. We'll see. Now, maybe she might have cut past the bagel one time or two where, you know, she may, maybe, maybe she went in the skin a little bit. You might, ha might have to ask her for that. That's too specific to not be true, right? But this is what I realized. Some of us have been living the spiritual equivalent of do not touch the stove and do not touch the knives and we have never matured past it. We've never gone beyond do's and don'ts in our faith. We've never gone beyond, okay, God, tell me yes or no. Tell me, pastor, yes or no. Tell me, friend, yes or no. Do's and don'ts without actually having to engage our mind, engage our thinking, engage our discernment to learn how to differentiate between good and evil. Let me ask you today, is your faith baby-proofed? Have you been walking around in a padded room, so to speak, with baby gates so that you will not suffer any harm. Scripture says in Hebrews chapter 5, verses 13 and 14, for everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of, righteous, in the work of, word of righteousness since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. There's a point of maturity where you got to practice your, your power of discernment so that you can discern in your spirit and in your mind what is good and what is evil. What matures you? Constant practice. Opening your mind, opening your heart, feeding your, your, your mind, thinking logically about things according to faith. And it's exposure that gives opportunity for your powers of discernment, as Scripture says, to work. Going past, okay, just tell me do's and don'ts, and I'll blindly just say yes and no to it. But having a power of discernment from within when you face challenges in life. This takes intentionality. This takes commitment. Because your faith will not grow through comfort. Your calling will not develop 
in a padded room with all the outlets covered and a baby gate at the door so you're safe and secure in that place. That's not the life that God has called you to live. God has called you to explore. This is a pilgrimage. And because maturity takes the good kind of suffering, sometimes if we're hardwired to never suffer and only seek comfort, we can lack the ability to mature in our faith because we chuck it as something not good. Because maturity is being able to discern good and choose good. And when you are committed to goodness, you will quickly realize this, that there are seasons and moments in life when evil is easy and goodness is hard. Now, you will go through seasons in life when lying will be easy and sticking to the truth will be hard. It will be the harder path. You'll go through seasons in life when hate will be easy. Outrage will be easy. And love will be hard. When giving up, walking away will be easy. But fighting through, sticking through it, persevering, that will be hard. And that's what the church in Smyrna was facing. You know, this church located in a in a beautiful city because during the Greco-Roman period the city of Smyrna had a, popula a population of about 100,000 people including a, a big Jewish presence in that city so it's, it's really about the size of Stanford in population because Stanford has about 130,000 people and Smyrna was beautiful Smyrna was wealthy Smyrna was a port city so there was a lot of trade and traffic going through Smyrna it was an important city to the empire, and it was a, an important city not only in Asia, but it was important around the entire Roman Empire. But even with all the advantages that that city had, Christians were suffering. Christians were having a really hard time. Listen to the letter in Revelation chapter 2, verses 8 through 11. The angel of the church in Smyrna, to the angel of church in Smyrna, Right. These are the words of God to John. These are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know about the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you. And you will suffer persecution for ten days. Be faithful, even to the point of death. And I will give you life as your victor's crown. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who is victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. This is an intricate and dense letter. You might ask, J.D., if Smyrna was so distinguished, if Smyrna was so blessed, why the disparity? Why the poverty? Why the difficulty? Why the suffering? Well, because of how wealthy Smyrna was. Smyrna became an important center for the Roman imperial cult. And history tells us that Anyone who refused to acknowledge Caesar as Lord would certainly be excluded from the guilds. They would be excluded from the commerce. They would be excluded from society. They would be excluded from any kind of benefit. And so when the scripture here says, I know your poverty, the word used in the original for poverty is abject poverty. These people had nothing. Absolutely nothing. They possessed nothing. And the Jews, the, what the scripture says here, those who call themselves Jews but are not, they're actually from the synagogue of Satan, were religious people who enjoyed protections under Roman law. But instead of practicing at the actual principles of Judaism, they were joining in with those who worshipped Caesar to, to persecute and slander the Christians. 
to add suffering to the Christians. Now, this is not a letter of correction toward Christians. This is a letter of encouragement. The only point of correction in this letter is against those who call themselves Jews but weren't. They're correcting them because they were luring and trying to get the followers of Christ away from their faith. But I believe there's a strong connection between us and between the people in this letter. There's a strong connection between this passage and our lives. See, this is not a community. If you look at the letter here, this is not a community that was seeking comfort and worldly advancement. And if you're here today, and that's what you're seeking, I don't blame you. You know, if you came here today and you're like, man, I need some comfort in my life. I, I need, I need, man, things have been difficult. And I just need a break. I need a breather. God, please help me. Help me get better. I don't blame you because for years and decades now, we have been sold a bill of goods that says that the ultimate good is comfort in every area of life. This is the pattern of our world. The ultimate good for you is comfort in every area of life. So when you hear the preacher say, God is good, when you hear this Christians say, God is good, what you actually hear, what some of you actually hear is, God will make my life better by removing every single difficulty in my life. That's what it translates to if we listen to the ways of the world. And that might get you going for a little while. That might get you going to church for a little while. That might get you praying for a little while. But here's the reality. Whether you are a Christian or not, if you're searching for truth, you'll realize that ultimate goodness is not comfort. Because that's, that's not where you thrive. Ultimate goodness, it's freedom from evil. And that sometimes will cost you. That sometimes will cause you to suffer, depending on your context. Listen to the words of Jesus when he prayed for his disciples and he prayed for you and me in John chapter 17, verses 15 through 17. It says this, My prayer is not that you take them out of this world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. Jesus was saying, God, they are not of this world. And my prayer is not that you take them out of it, but that you, you deliver them, you protect them from the evil one. The more you search, the more you ask, the more you seek, the more you will realize that what you desire, what you want at an elemental level, at a foundational level in your life, transcends this world. You know, it's not just about where you live and what mattress you sleep on and what kind of foods you have and what kind of car you drive. That's, that's, that's too material. The things that our soul want, the things that our heart desire, they are transcendent. They transcend this life and this world. Now let me ask you this. What would make someone stick with their faith at their own peril? Because this is what's happening in the church of Smyrna. What would it make someone watch their kids suffer because they confess Jesus, because they believe in Jesus, and still claim Christ as their Lord? What, what, what would cause somebody to do that? Would God even allow that? Would a good God allow people to suffer simply because they claim to believe in Christ? Why follow Christ when everything could be at risk? Why follow Christ when everything you have, all your relationships and opportunities could be at risk? Risk Only a buffoon would do that, right? To risk everything for Christ seems foolishness, buffoonery. Well, you'd have to ask yourself a deeper question. What is everything? What do you call everything? What has framed 
to be everything in your life? What, what has been framed? What kind of values frame your everything? Is your job your everything? Is that what defines your identity? Is your career your everything? Are your possessions your everything? Is comfort your everything? Friends, we'll never learn to let go of everything until Christ becomes our everything. Whatever claims to be everything in our life, we're going to try to protect it, and it's going to take precedence over our faith in Christ. And that's why Christ introduces himself in this letter as someone they would recognize. He says, I'm the first and the last. I'm the one who died and the one who rose again. In other words, I'm your everything. I'm the beginning and the end in your life. I'm the first and the last in your life. I died, I suffered too, and I have conquered death. Think about it from a, from a, from a heart of somebody who's looking for meaning in life. Isn't that what we're looking for? Something or someone who can be the first and the last in our life. Something or someone who could be our everything. What else in your life can occupy and, and measure up to first and last? In your experiences, in your search, in your, in your desire, in your life. Some of you, you had a life before Christ. You know, your BC life where you were living in darkness and you were searching for your first and your last. That's really what you were looking for. Maybe you didn't know at the time, but you were looking for God. You were looking for your everything. And maybe you searched in parties and you searched in money and you searched in career and you searched in all of these portals and segments and things in life. And you're here today because none of those things could satisfy you. You're here today because there's no attention in the world. There's no amount of followers in the world. There's no amount of praise in the world. There's no amount of success in the world that could satisfy the quench in your soul, the, the, the thirst in your soul, that could quench the thirst in your soul for this, this desire that we have to cling our life to what could be first and last. Now, once you realize that only Christ can measure up to that, you have clarity. You have clarity on what is good. That's when, you can re that's when you can clearly discern between good and evil. That's when you can mature. That's when you can take away the baby proofing from your faith. When you, when you realize that Christ is the measure. Christ is the one who can measure up to that requirement in our soul. And you know, I've seen this play out in my life in several seasons. There were several seasons where we had to make decisions and we came across moments in our lives that were fundamentally necessary where, where we had to choose. There was a necessity of choosing and the choice had to be made between what was going to be ultimately good or ultimately bad. And living the good life is not living the comfortable life. Living the good life is living free from evil. So that's the discernment that you have to have in your heart. I remember when Alini and I were just talking, we had feelings. We felt feelings for each other. And we kind of knew that we had feelings um, and, and that we could go all the way. We had expressed our feelings. and You know, we weren't just going to let passion take over that wasn't the way to go. There was too much at stake. And I was living in Brazil when she had an academic scholarship to Yukon. She was going to go to med school. And she had a full ride academic scholarship to Yukon for that. And we were young and we had big aspirations. And we were literally living worlds apart. And so choosing marriage would mean a level of suffering a level of sacrifice on each one of our parts. So we had to make that choice. We had to sacrifice and, and think about it with discernment. But there's a particular season where 
this kind of discernment really took a lot of faith for us to choose good. It was when we were here in Connecticut. We had just moved to start the church, and we were a few months in, and it, it was really difficult. It was not going well. You know, the, all the process, all the project was delayed, and Alini was pregnant with a high-risk pregnancy. Some of you know our story. We were struggling financially. Only a handful of people were willing to help out with the church, and they were struggling financially as well. We didn't have any big backer or influx of cash to just say, here it is, go, you know, start the mission work, and, and we'll, we'll fund you. It was really a grassroots movement with faithful people giving out of their, of their sacrificial giving and, and, and building God's church, and it was really difficult. And I got a call from a pastor who I had met and respected, who pastors a big church in Newfield, Connecticut. And this pastor, this church is about 2,000 members, and they have a private school on site, K through high school, and uh, a ministry that's well-established in that region. And so he began a conversation. He began to pursue me, and he was quite aggressively because he wanted us to join forces, and he wanted us to come work for him. He offered us, we talked about salary, we talked about benefits, we talked about everything. He was going to employ both of us, give us uh, benefits. Our combined salary was going to be above six figures, so that was good at the time. And all kids would get free education in his private school, and we would have uh, the opportunity to be near the hospital where my wife had to go daily for monitoring. We would be near the hospital, and, and instead of having to drive each, one hour each way up to Danbury, and we had to think about it. Because it felt at the time like, man, this, this might be an answered prayer. Because it, it's literally everything that we need right now in this season. Except that's not what we were called to do. So we had to yield the discernment. This is not a do and don't thing. This is not a kid choice. It takes maturity. Do we choose the path of comfort? Or do we choose the path that God has laid out for us and that he had directed us to do. And even though, man, I could just take this job, I thought I could just take this job for a couple years and let the dust settle and then later plant Connect Community, I could do that. It wouldn't be very nice to them, but I could do that. In any other field, it'll be okay. But in what we do, it's not, it's not a career path. You understand, like, this is a calling like I'm, I'm, accounted, I'm, accounted, I'm accountable to God. I'm accountable to, to God's calling. And so the Holy Spirit didn't really give us peace. And I remember answering the phone in our last conversation about it. And I, I was 100% honest. I said, hey, pastor, I love the proposition. I think we would work well together. I have a spirit of honor in my heart. So I know that I would be able to honor your ministry, honor your mantle, honor your calling, and, and really support you in your ministry. I think we would do well together, but if I'm going to be honest with you, the number one motivation for me to join you right now is financial relief. If I had money in the bank right now, I would not come work for you. That's really what it is. Even though it may be a good opportunity, it may, even though it may be uh, a, a better opportunity, uh, situation for us right now the number one drive for me to consider this is financial relief and so in light of that I must choose obedience to Christ and he, kinda, he was kind of disappointed he got it you know and then he said hey my friend maybe this is the money test you know he's a few years my senior so he kind of took a, a, a mentor type of, of role in that conversation and he, he began to talk about you know how we all go through the money test and and maybe this is, this is what God was taking us through. And until that day, he kind of, until, until today, he te kind of teases me when we cross paths in pastor's meetings and things. He said, hey, you made, you made the wrong choice. <laughs> we should have been working together. <laughs> he teases me like that. And I'd love to tell you that the moment I made that decision, the moment we passed the test, was when the doors opened and everything got better. I'd love to tell you that the moment I said no to that job, the floodgates of heaven poured out. It did not happen that way. There was suffering in the path. 
that we chose. There was difficulty in the path that we chose. But we knew it was the good path. We knew it was the godly path. We knew it was the choice that God had for us. And this is what I realized in that season. And this is something that it's, it's I, hope, I hope it blesses you. Because in that season, my faith, my fervor, my devotion to God was not just trying to get out of my situation. I really wanted to obey and follow God and trust Him. And if I were to choose what's comfortable, I would have been giving myself the choice of recalibrating my compass. You know, we all have a compass that, that points us in, 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 in what we choose. Like, it's, it's, it's what drives our discernment. And I would have had calibrated my compass to say, it's okay, J.D., to choose comfort before ob obedience to God. So it's not just about that one decision. It's about what that one decision would cause my every subsequent decision. What, what the effect that that would have in my every other decision. Do you understand what I'm saying? The moment we make a decision where we put something else and we choose something else to be our everything, every subsequent decision suffers from that problem as well. And my heart, by the grace of God, was to say, God, I'm going to choose you. Listen to this passage in 1 Peter. Chapter 5, verses 8 through 11. This is our last scripture of today. Be alert and sober-minded. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him. Stand firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. You're not alone. You're not alone in what you're going through. This is part of our call. This is part of our journey. And the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ after you have suffered a little while will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. Friends, some of you are living this passage right now. You're going through circumstances that are causing you to suffer. You're going through situations where maybe it's your, your, cho your choice of obedience to Christ is causing your life to be more difficult. But let me encourage you like Peter encouraged the church. After you have suffered a little while, the God of all faith will strengthen you and he will make you strong again. After you have suffered a little while, he will give you relief. After you have suffered a little while, he will give you victory. Hold on. Hold on to God's promise. Hold on to God's world, word. Allow God to be your first and your last. Continue to choose Him to be your everything. You know, sometimes we'll suffer setbacks. And according to the patterns of this world, if you suffer a setback, a setback you're on the wrong path. But not for us. Even if you're not a Christian, you'll realize that that's not the right pattern. You know, the question is, what is your everything? What is your everything? And my question to you today is, is God your everything? Is God your everything? Remember, the only way to grow is to challenge the status quo. The only way to get stronger is to sustain a heavy load. The only way to get faster is by running hard past your limits. I believe it's time for us to remove the baby proofing from our faith today. To make Christ the first and the last in our lives. To make Christ your everything. You know, we're living in a world where people are making things that are not supposed to be their everything. They're everything. In fact, you know, yesterday we all learned that there was an attempt on former President Trump. And this is not a political point that I'm making. 
the point that I'm making is that there are people out there who are making their political views their everything to the point that they're willing to do such a thing. Now, in our, in our culture, in our country, this has been the norm for quite some time. You know, Theodore Roosevelt was one of the presidents who had an attempt in his life. Somebody tried to shoot him. Of course, we all know that John F. Kennedy was assassinated. We know Ronald Reagan had an attempt on his life. I believe even George Bush Sr. had an attempt on his life, if I remember correctly. So this is not a unique situation. But it's a picture of a, of a culture that's made, making their political aims their everything. And you can see how, how it throws the entire system, the, all, our, all society, our society, and through disarray. When we make something that's not supposed to be our everything our everything. My plead with you today is that we would get this right. If we can get this right, you will live Christ's promise, not only for this life, that you will overcome, that He will deliver you, but for the next life as well. Because here's His, prom here's his promise. The one who is victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. Do you receive it this morning? Amen.